Today, we have an incredibly sophisticated scientific laboratory in space. OSOs, OGOs, OAOs, IMPs, RAEs, and other scientific satellites carry the experiments of famous scientists from many nations. This achievement can only be understood by measuring it against generations of scientific endeavor. shadows of a launch control room, watching his instruments roar aloft to gather knowledge for the bank. The tools of investigation have changed since Franklin's day, but the methods have not. His kite is a spacecraft, his key a cosmic ray detector, or a miniaturized mass spectrometer. His string, the stream of data linking the experiments with the ground station. Space science is science done in space. The laboratory has become enormous. Space science began with the first balloon carrying photographic film to detect cosmic rays above the curtain of the atmosphere. These balloons investigated the first 35 miles up, the troposphere and stratosphere as we call them. Beginning in 1945, scientific sounding rockets began mapping the ionosphere that is, from about 35 miles up to about 1,000 miles. Sounding rockets do not orbit like satellites. Instead, they take an important vertical sample of the upper atmosphere and also make measurements at altitudes too low for satellites. And when the sun flares up, its energy interacts vigorously with the magnetosphere, the ionosphere, and the atmosphere in very noticeable ways. If you look to the right-hand side, you'll notice we're getting a very pronounced aurora over the entire sky. And further south... I can hardly hear you. Can you hear me? Mom? Mom? Can you hear me? Isn't this a terrible connection? The long-range forecasters said today that high radiation levels may force postponement of this important manned flight. From this research in space, the physicist can, for the first time, begin to understand the Earth-Sun relationship as a single system. And as they look beyond our star, they begin to sense the presence of titanic forces as awesome as lightning was to primitive man.
the first areas of satellite exploration in the 1970s will be in what we call the transition region of the upper atmosphere from 75 to 95 miles. In this region, harmful solar radiations are screened out. A new generation of atmosphere explorers will carry small rocket engines to help them overcome the drag of the very few air molecules in that region and to propel the spacecraft to different altitudes. Instruments that will count electrons, ions, and neutral atoms and take their temperatures will be carried aboard, as well as those for measuring the fluxes and energies of fast electrons, and instruments to measure the sun's ultraviolet light, which affects these particles. The effect on the particles is something like what goes on in the kettle on your stove. If you look at molecules of boiling water under a microscope, you get an idea of how the sun's energy stirs up the particles in the transition region of the atmosphere. We are interested in these reactions for the same reasons that James Watt was interested in boiling water before he invented the steam engine. A small but important satellite of the 70s will be the SSS, which stands for Small Scientific Satellite. The mission of SSSA will be to investigate in detail some of the phenomena discovered by the larger observatory satellites in the 1960s. The SSS can be launched by the Scout Vehicle, a rocket which is readily transportable to any site in the world. SSSA will be launched from the Italian San Marco range off the eastern African coast in order to concentrate on charged particles and magnetic ring currents around the equator. While an economical spacecraft like the SSS is at work, an old established satellite will be continuing in business in the space between Earth and the Moon. These are the OGOs, the orbiting geophysical observatories of the 60s. Six of these OGOs were flown each with an expected lifetime of one year. Today, after nearly a decade of service, two of them are still going strong, even though their original missions are accomplished. Now, scientists from all over the world have been invited to plan new observations using the instruments on board the OGOs. Because there is a long line of experiments waiting for a flight on new spacecraft, this further use on experienced satellites will be a valuable resource for space scientists in coming years. To fly the increasingly sophisticated space instruments of the 70s, instruments which will analyze the discoveries of the 60s, NASA is planning the launch of three more interplanetary monitoring platforms, nicknamed IMP. From 1963 to 1969, seven of these satellites have returned enormous quantities of data from vast areas of space. They have flown in a series of eccentric orbits, cigar-shaped rather than circular. These included the so-called anchored imp, which orbits the moon. These spacecraft provided the first accurate measurements of the interplanetary magnetic field the boundaries of the magnetosphere, and the shock front or bow wave set up by the shield of the magnetosphere against the solar wind. Without this shield, the Earth would be struck full blast. Three new imps will seek the answers to the sources of energy in the particles trapped by our magnetosphere. They will also try to find out what it is that changes their speed. These super imps of the 70s have three times the size and ability of their ancestors. They will carry instruments ranging from Geiger counter telescopes to a small computer and will study a wide variety of phenomena, cosmic rays, gamma rays, solar protons, electric and magnetic fields, and the solar wind. Balloons, planes, sounding rockets, atmospheric explorer, the SSS, OGO and IMP. This is the versatile bag of tools with which the astrophysicist of the 70s will examine the environment of Earth. Every day the need to understand becomes greater. 
These are questions which will sooner or later affect the lives of all of us. The space maps which are being made by the satellites of today will be to future explorers what the early maps of this continent were to those who opened the West. Day after day, the space physicist continues to make important deposits in the bank of knowledge. Their instruments fly side by side, sometimes even in the same spacecraft. The physicist is an indoor man. He works in a very limited laboratory. It is only a billion miles wide. The astronomer, on the other hand, works outside that area. He is studying phenomena at distances which range to the very edges of the universe. However, the physicist and the astronomer do have one thing in common, the sun. This incredible furnace converts over 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second. Every square yard of its surface emits 70,000 horsepower into space as X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, and infrared rays, and as radio waves. To the physicist, study of the sun is the key to the origin and survival of life on Earth. To the astronomer, the sun is the only star near enough to be observed in any detail. Since the telescope was invented in 1610, the astronomer's lens has been partially obscured by the Earth's atmosphere. He is continually plagued by the distorting qualities of air, to say nothing of pollution. He has also found that very little other than visible light and radio waves can penetrate it. Ultraviolet, infrared, X-rays, and gamma rays, in fact, over 90% of the electromagnetic spectrum are all stopped by the atmosphere. As a result, the astronomer has always carried his telescopes as high as he could but only in the last few years has he been able to rise completely above the heavy curtain between himself and the universe. Knowledge of the sun and stars has expanded proportionately. This is one of the orbiting solar observatories, the seventh in its line, and the first of four planned for the 70s. Osos are easily recognized by their sail, the portion which locks onto the sun while the bottom wheel spins like a gyroscope to stabilize the spacecraft. Here under test at Cape Kennedy, prior to launch, you can see how motors turn the sail to keep it steadily pointing at the sun. Oso's sensors, in this case X-ray and ultraviolet spectrometers, scan the sun in the same way as a TV camera, except very slowly adding one line at a time to eventually return data which can be visualized like this. A solar map actually drawn by a computer. Considering that the sun's weight is 335,000 times that of Earth, you can imagine the length of time we have needed to complete our picture of its surface, its temperatures, and its thermonuclear behavior. Ten years of space science research have solved some mysteries and presented some profound new ones. Mysteries which may be close to explaining man's role in the universe. Within the next ten years, many of these mysteries, complex as they are, will be well within the grasp of anyone with a curious and restless mind. Imagine a form of matter which the more you look at it, the less you can see. A star which is collapsing so fast that no light can escape from it, leaving a black hole in the sky. When scientific satellites look across the universe to the quasars, they may be looking billions of years into the past. When they look at a supernova, an exploding sun so bright as to actually cast shadows on Earth, they may be looking billions of years into our future. To a visitor from an equally curious planet, the Earth would have looked no different than this. That day in 1752, when Franklin established the relationship between lightning and electricity. On the cosmic scale, little time at all has elapsed since that event.
Although our scientific knowledge has exploded at a rate equal to what we imagine the explosive creation of the universe to have been 10 billion years ago. In that so recent tick of time, Benjamin Franklin deposited his findings by hand, by candlelight. Today, by electric light and into an electric ledger, the physicist and the astronomer enter their deposits of knowledge. Little by little, they build a picture of nameless new forces, beside which electricity is an infant. It makes one wonder by what light and into what ledger we will record the future, the future which space science has already placed in our hands. Want to eat over my house tonight? Sure, but I gotta call my mom first. We'll call her from my place. I got some new records. We can do our homework. Yeah. And, psst. Uh huh? Hey, kids, come here. Psst. It's that guy over there in the doorway. I wonder who he is. Come here, kids. I want to talk to you. What do you want? I got something special for you. Something really good. We don't want any. No, wait a minute, Mom. You know. Let's see what it is first. No! Don't be a square, kid. It won't uh, hurt you. Come here. No! You take a look? I mean, just a, a look? Mike, no! Because what I want to show you is this uh, book. Yeah, a free book. Filled with my special diets and amazing foods. That I can sell you cheap. Really cheap. Mike, don't do it! But it's free, Mulligan. Yeah, Mulligan, it's free. You want one? No! Well, that's too bad, Mulligan, because your friend here is going to have all the fun. Going to build strong muscles and get quick energy. Never have a cold again. Never have to eat any of those foods he doesn't want to eat, like no vegetables, no fruits, nothing that he doesn't like. No meat, no bread, no milk, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Because my book shows you 42 different ways how you can. Why, you can live on one of my great quickie diets or special meals. Just take a food substitute pill and a little bit of water. Or eat rice, man. Nothing but rice. Morning, noon, and night. And get pure. Really pure. Don't take it, Mike. Don't take the book. Pure? Pure, baby. Like pure. No, Mike! Go on. Do it. Thank you. He gave me a, a pamphlet on a special diet, all for me. Well, you better throw that thing away, because you know and I know that there's no shortcut to good eating. You have to eat the I don't know, Mulligan. Some of the things he said are pretty good. I think I'm going to try it. Mike, I'm warning you, you might get sick or something. Oh, Mulligan, what could happen? It's just no good, that's all. out important foods from your diet is no good. It'll only affect your health. You have to eat right, to do right, and feel right. Right on!
additives are simply chemicals that either come from nature or are made in a laboratory as we're in today and they do all kinds of things that are basically either nutritious or they extend shelf life or they make foods more attractive but just remember mulligan that they have been tested by both industry and government and they're there for a purpose so additives in your food are important one reason foods are enriched is to put back the nutrients lost during processing oh i don't think i understand that for example when flour is processed some of the vitamins are lost so before baking bread some of the vitamins are put back into the flour this is called enrichment. You're putting me on. No, it's true. Honest. I swear it. Ask my mother if you want to. It's true. Vitamins are essential nutrients. Minerals are essential nutrients. Like iron, calcium, and iodine. You get iron from meats like liver. You get calcium from milk and cheese. You get iodine from seafood. And it's in iodine salt. Protein is an essential nutrient. You get protein from meat, fish, chicken, eggs, peas, beans, and nuts. Carbohydrates and fats are essential nutrients. You get carbohydrates from bread, cereal, spaghetti, macaroni, and noodles. Well, Sonny boy, why don't you run along? Because uh, your friends here and I have got a little uh, business to transact. Don't fall for this guy! These diets, these shortcuts, they're no good for you! Oh, Mulligan, stop being such a fraidy cat. You're too square, Mulligan. You now, who wants to see my latest book? It's the amazing diet that slims off inches and purifies your whole system. Four, four, three, two. Four servings of fruit and vegetables, three servings of bread and cereals, and two of no, 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 that's wrong. Uh, four servings of, of bread and cereals, three servings of no, 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 that's wrong. Uh, four servings of fruit and vegetables, three, four servings of bread and cereals, uh, three servings of, of milk a day, and uh, two servings of meat. <laughs> A balanced diet means eating the right amounts of food from the four food groups. Your body needs this. You can't eat just one good meal and expect to feel better right away. You have to eat a balanced diet regularly, every day, to feel on top of it all the time. There's no shortcut to good health and good eating. You have to eat a balanced diet each day. If you eat the proper amounts of the right foods regularly, you needn't take any vitamin pills or extra vitamins at all. You'll get it all from the foods you eat. Really? I didn't know that. That's right. And the only extra vitamin you'll need is uh, some vitamin D, which you can pick up in a couple of glasses of vitamin D fortified milk each day. Vitamin D is an additive in milk. That's why some additives are important, because they add vitamins, minerals, and proteins, nutrients that we need to stay healthy on. Some additives are put there just to make the food taste good.
now I'm busy. But this is important! Well, how is this? I'm doing my income tax. What could possibly be more important than income tax? 